been a long time. Right? There's been a lot of things happened uh, since the last time we were here and uh, by God's grace there's also been a lot of light that I'm glad that we can be here to make sure that we all understand it, that we see how easy it is to see and understand and how the whole Bible is just one story, it's all speaking the same thing, there's no contradictions and that God really has a people and as broken and defective as we are, he's training us, right? And we can prove that just by these truths alone, right? And because it's not possible for human beings to, to invent such a thing out of a book, right? <laughs> so, um, anyway, what I, I, at least I have some plans to do is um, to go back to an early stage and, and lay a groundwork down that we all make sure that we are um, singing off the same song sheet and then um, <clears throat> just progress through and, and lay on different themes one after another and go through it point by point, right? So this is not a, it's not a church where the preacher speaks and everybody sits and keeps quiet, right? These are classes, right? So please, at any time you want to interject, ask a question, or ask for something to be explained, then please do so, because otherwise we're sort of wasting our time. We need to, can't leave all those things till later, right? We need to deal with each point as we go along, right? Unless we can deal with it, and then we can maybe do it a bit later. But um, so everybody, please feel free to interact. And um, I have a, I have a document that I've been putting together, and um, I didn't get it finished as much as I want. Y yes, I'll start one second. I have a document I put together that I, I didn't get uh, as far as I would like. But what I plan to do is I put headings of all different themes and all the quotes, right? And I put it on a document, I'll just send it to everybody. So if we want to find something, we just go to the heading, go to that page and find the quote, right? And we can, saves us a lot of time, right? Rather than having individual notes, which take a lot of time to, to prepare. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let's open then with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for the privilege to be here. I want to thank you also, uh, even more so, for all the brethren that could be here. Lord, I know how difficult it's been over the last two years with all the troubles that's going on, all the things that's happening in the world, and the requirement for us to understand those things out of your word and to put them uh, correctly together so that the whole Bible is teaching the same thing and Lord you've brought many trials upon us and some people that were here two years ago are not here any longer and, um, but in spite of that I just pray that you would be present that your angels would make up the numbers and that you would bless us and truly really fill our hearts with heaven's peace and we thank you and ask this in the name of Jesus Amen, Amen. Okay, so now I'll just go back a little bit. Brother Jeff, right? For those that don't know, his wife died just a few weeks ago, and it's a bit of a tragedy, right? And you know, as I've gone through this message over the years, I've seen what's happened to all those people when they reject truth, and it's terrible. You, you, you really can't imagine 
You know, when you reject truth, you reject Christ. If the Holy Spirit convicts you something's true and later you reject it, that's the unpardonable sin. Sister White says very clearly. And um, I, I, I've seen so many people go and they've become the most nastiest of people. Nasty, bitter, and, you know, the people out there in the world have a nicer character than some of these people. And brothers and sisters, we must understand that the truth is what sanctifies us. It says, the truth shall make you free. And I remember when I came out of the world and I heard that verse for the first time, that sung in my heart, the truth shall make you free. Because I realized that there's so much lies, so much deception going on in this world. And it says, thy word is truth. So the only way that we can know what is truth and be saved from Satan's deceptions is through the word of prophecy, right? And the whole Bible is a narrative about God's people at the end of the world. Not just parts of it, the whole Bible. And it's so profound when we see it all coming together, right? So, however, the reason why I mentioned Brother Jeff is because, at least from my part, the controversy that I had with them back now, 2015, 16, was that they, they were taking all these stories and throwing them into a space on the board and it was just a bunch of jumbled inconsistencies, right? <laughs> I was like, no way, that can't be. And it can't be because God is a God of order. God is a perfect God. You know, when Christ came out of the grave, what did he do? Come on, brothers and sisters, we should all know this. What did he do? What's the most specific thing that he did? He folded his clothes, right? Now, there's a thousand sermons in that one action, right? You can't tell me that you can deal lightly with God's word, right? With the amount of warnings in here about tampering with his word, right? Christ says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, right? And it says, add thou not unto my words, lest I reprove thee, and thee be found a liar, right? And who is a liar? Satan, right? Only the truth sanctifies. Only the reception of the truth into your heart can cleanse you of all the evils that we need to be cleansed of, right? We must be pure and holy temples. All our false concepts, all our evils, all our wicked worldly ways have to be cleansed out of us, right? And that doesn't happen at the snap of a finger, right? It takes time. How do we know that it takes time? Where do we have a living illustration of it taking time? Come on, we are Seventh-day Adventists. We're familiar with our Bibles. What about Christ's disciples? Did they, did they immediately learn overnight? No. It took them some years, three and a half years, day in, day out, with the greatest teacher that ever lived. And did they get it? <laughs> no, right? He had to bring them through the worst disappointment before they finally got it, right? And God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts, right? And when we come to his word, we must come like little children. We must have an open heart to say, Lord, teach me, right? Jesus only explained the truth to those that ran after him and said, Lord, what does that mean? Why did you say that? Those that argued in their mind, oh, he must be mad, right? He didn't explain it to them, right? And brothers and sisters, we must search our hearts, right? When these things are coming forward, if we don't understand, we must never trust in ourselves, right? It says, cursed be the man that puts his trust in man, right? The heart of man is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it, right? So, I just want us to remember these principles, right? Only the reception of the truth into the heart and the practicing of it is what will save us. And Satan knows it. And he's on the ground at all these meetings to distract us, 
to put our minds away in different directions, to bring controversies in, etc., etc., right? We must be prayerful, right? Prayer is the breath of heaven, right? If you see people not praying, <laughs> they have no connection with Christ. How can they then know what's, how, what his word says, right? Okay, so I want to encourage us, because the times that we're living in, brothers and sisters, they are serious. Serious even more so for this little movement, right? We're about to be tested badly. And therefore, we must be people of prayer, right? We must have a need for Christ. If we have no need, then he will pass us by. He will go to people that have a need, right? Because we cannot save ourselves, we can't change ourselves, we are evil, right? And we need to be clean, right? And only Christ can do that. He says, ye shall seek me, and ye shall find me when? You search for me with all your heart, right? And he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek for him, right? Okay, so that's what we're going to do over this next 10 days. We're going to diligently pray, diligently seek for him. We're going to pray for one another, right? We're not going to bring in silly arguments. We're going to put our own thoughts to one side, and we're going to go to the Word. And whatever the Word shows us and proves to us, that's what we accept, right? Not man's ideas. Because it says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them, right? Amen? Amen? Okay, so let these thoughts be uppermost in our minds. Does everybody here have Miller's Rules? Anybody not have Miller's Rules? Maybe that's an easier question. Miller's Rules? These, the rules. Everybody have some? Said? You have some, Bishop? No? Then you have to tell me, then I'll give you one. Right? I have a few sets here if somebody needs one. Don't be shy. I won't bite you. Okay, because these rules, right, these rules are our guide, right? We must understand them. We must use them, right, and not trust in ourselves, right? And we will see as we go through, when we have points of controversy, we will go to those rules, right? And we will use them, and we will see that really our ways are foolish. They're not according to God's ways of thinking, right? So, let's begin, right? And the point I want to make is God is teaching us. Let's go to Isaiah 28, right? Now, we're just going to do a little bit of revision tonight to lay out the structure, and that's what we're going to build upon, right? Verse 9. And Christ is speaking here, and he's asking a question. Whom shall he teach knowledge? So he's asking, or Isaiah saying, who is God going to teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, right? And this is speaking about the latter rain, right? Because when you come down to verse 12, he says, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear, right? So, who is going to receive the latter rain according to these words? Those that are weaned from milk, right? Okay, and Brother Lawrence, he will, when we get to this point, go through Galatians chapter 4, and he will show us very clearly from God's word that we are drinking milk, right? So all these deep truths that we think are so fantastic, they are only the milk, right? And we have much to learn and we are babies, right? And we need to be taught, right, in order that we can be full-grown adults to be sent in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And those truths, according to these words, come to us 
line upon lie, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, right? Okay, but um, verse 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Um, no, sorry, go, excuse me, go to verse 12. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. What will they not hear? What will they not receive? The lot of rain, right? And why can't you receive the lot of rain? What, what prevents us from receiving the latter rain? Let me show this. Go to Jeremiah chapter uh, 4, I think it is. Further chapter. No, go to chapter 3, excuse me. And verse 3. It says, therefore, the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead that refuses to be ashamed. So, what, sorry? Chapter 3, sorry, I said 4, but it was 3. Excuse me, 3, 3. So what prevents us from receiving the latter rain? 3, 3. Chapter 3, verse 3. Right? A horse for it. A horse for it, right? So, who's the whore? What does it mean? Woman. Yeah, the, the, the woman, right? And what's a woman represent? Church. Yes, but, but okay, not exactly. A, is a, a church is based upon what? doctrine, right? The woman represents a doctrine, because all the kings of the earth have been drinking of her wine, right? And wine is doctrine. So the woman represents an impure doctrine, right? So what is it that prevents us from receiving the latter rain? Yes, these false doctrines that we have been brought up and trained to think and act the way that we act, right? So we need to be cleansed, right? And the promise, let's go to the promise, go to Ezekiel chapter 36. Verse 22. Now, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, right? So, who is it that has a horse forehead? Yes, us, right? It says, Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes. Who's going to do it? God, right? O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. What have we done? We've profaned his name, we've took his name in vain, right? And I will sanctify my great name which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. So he's going to do something so amazing that the whole world is going to know that God has a people, right? And he's going to do it, not us, something that he does, right? For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and I will bring you into your own land. So when's he going to do that? Yes, when you're sanctified and he's in agreement with the land. What goes in agreement with the land? The birth, right? promise given to Abraham, right? He was given two things, the birth and the land, right? Okay. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also 
will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away this stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. Who's going to do that? God. And cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleannesses, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree, and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways, and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Now, Sister White, did Sister White think highly of herself, or did she loathe herself? She loathed herself, and you know her favorite song had these words in it, right? I, I can't, I, well, I will. Yeah, Jesus, lover of my soul, and in. Yeah. Uh, read, read it. Vile and full of sin I am. That was her favorite song, right? And Sister White walked humbly before God. She didn't trust in her feelings. She was assailed by the devil constantly. She saw the evils in her own heart, right? But she put her trust complicitly in Christ. And that's where Christ needs to get us, right? Once we are laid flat in the dust and all our pride and glory is gone, then he will fill us with his spirit. Amen? Amen. And in order for that to happen, he has to teach us how he can get us there. Because he's not going to force you. He's not waving a magic wand. He's getting you to a point that he can do it because he's waiting, right? He, he, he would have us years ago raised up, filled with the Holy Spirit. But just like the disciples, what was their problem? They were dim, slow of hearing, dull, right? And <laughs> that's our sinfulness, like our worldliness. That unless Christ came, we would all be doomed for eternity, right? So, Isaiah 28, the Lord's going to teach us line upon line, precept upon precept, right? That's how the latter rain is going to come. So, before you can receive the latter rain, what must you receive first? Okay, how do we know that that's true? No, because the Bible says, doth not nature teach you, right? Does nature show that there are two rains? Did Jesus use us as a seed and as this little delicate plant? Yes? And he breaks up the ground and then he puts in the seed, right? That's the new birth. Right? So why, can't, why is he unable to put the seed into the ground? What's wrong with the ground? It's rock hard. It says, break up your fallow ground till I come in, rain righteousness upon you, right? See, once this ground, this heart has been made good ground, and the seed is implanted, what is guaranteed? It will, it will bud forth, right? As long as you follow Christ the way that he has designed, right? And he will bring us to make these beautiful plants at the end of the world that he can take to heaven. Amen? But the problem is, our hearts are so stony that that seed finds no entrance, right? Just let's show this point. Go to 1 John chapter 3. Verse 9. 
It says, whosoever is what? Born. Born of God. Now, what did we just read in Ezekiel 36? What was it referring to? The new birth, right? The new heart, right? So it says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, right? It's no longer on stony ground. It takes root deep, right? And he cannot sin because he's born of God. That's where we need to be, brothers and sisters. Because we read in Ezekiel 36, he's going to cause us to walk in his ways and keep his statutes and do them, right? Through the power of the Spirit. Okay? So, God is teaching us line upon line how to get to this point, right? And through this principle of line upon line, we have the reform lines, right? We're not going to start teaching the reform lines there, we're just going to go basic oversight, right? So there are four main lines, right? And the four lines is one of Moses, which was the Alpha, line of Christ, which was the Omega, the three decrees, which was the Alpha, and the Millerite line was the Omega. Why am I doing that? Yes, okay. Okay, but why? Why, why is Christ teaching this way? Sorry? Because Christ is that kind of Right, because he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, right? That's who he is, it's his signature. And brothers and sisters, that is the ultimate number one truth that this movement has been given at the end of the world, right? Every, every generation that he, he comes and he works through, he gives them a specific truth, right? A present truth for that time. And the, what is the present truth for our time? In a nutshell. The, the whole Bible is speaking about the end of the world, right? The whole Bible, every word, right? It's the effect of every vision. And brothers and sisters, you are the most privileged people in this whole world, right? To be sitting here and to be part of this movement. And you must grasp that, right? Never lose sight of the fact that Christ is not, an, is not any accident that he brings you, right? Every one of you is choosing to be part of this or choosing to not be part of it, right? But the fact that you're here, he's called you. He has a purpose for you, right? Don't look at one another and think evil of one another like Peter did to John, and etc., etc. They were all trying to exalt over one another, right? Every single person here has a part to play, and we must realize that, right? And Sister White says, we are under the, um, what's the word she uses? The, the what? Dispensation. Yes, yes. Yeah. The, we're under the, the, the dispensation of the whole Bible, right? So all the testimony that was written here in the past, even some of it that's not been fulfilled yet, right, is speaking to us, right? And it's all pointing to a perfect fulfillment in the near future time to come, right? And the former reign, in relation to what we're talking about, what is it? <coughs> the, the types, right? Because the latter reign is, is doctrine, right? It's this doctrine that he wants to fill us with, right? But unless we understand the types and what they point to, we will never receive the latter reign, right? So Christ is teaching us types, and that's what these are, right? These are typifying something for us at the end of the world, right? And we're to bring them together, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, right? So, why is this the Alpha and this the Omega? Yes, 
Sorry? Okay, just you speak, Brian, so I can hear. Sorry? Say, say it again, please. Moses was a type of Christ. Yes, Moses was a type of Christ. Right? So Moses was the type, Christ was the antitype. Antitype. But was Christ, after he fulfilled his role, is he also a type? Yes. Because both Moses and Christ are typifying his people at the end of the world, right? Christ says, pick up your cross and follow me, right? So every step that Christ took, you're to take because he's illustrating us, right? That's why he came, right? It's not just about, well, Jesus did it all, we just need to believe in him. No, Jesus was making a pattern because he's the pattern man that we have to follow, right? So, and, right, so you have the, Moses is the type, Christ is the anti-type, right? And as we go down uh, through these points, right, you have the um, reformer being raised up, circumcision and baptism both represent the new birth, right? So this is what we've just been speaking about, the new birth, right? So you've got a, let's see, this new birth, Mark right there at the end, right? And when you come to the next part, right, you've got um, the Mark Pharaoh here begins to persecute God's people. Sister White says, represents the Sunday law, right? You have these plagues, and it leads you to the Passover, right? And the Passover is parallel to the cross in Christ's time, right? So you have this parallel two parallel lines leading you down to the same point. Now if you just go to Romans chapter 6, I'll just make a point quickly. Because this is another topic that by God's grace we will get onto. I'm sure Brother Lawrence will probably cover this when he does Galatians 4. Um, and this, you know, it's, it's really the crux of the whole gospel to understand these things, right? So Romans 6, and verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. So, what two things are being paralleled? The baptism and the and the cross, right? So the cross is here, right? So because the cross was also the new birth, right? Because you can also show that the cross is Pentecost, right? And, and the point I want to get to see is all these reformers, when we bring them together, it's showing us these two periods of time, right? Now, at the beginning here, Pharaoh's persecuting God's people, right? What about at the birth of Moses? There was another pharaoh, right? Yes. Two pharaohs, right? Yes. And this pharaoh, who was he? The Assyrian, right? And what does Sister White say about the Assyrian? Uh, okay, maybe that's a bad question. She, he's, he makes a Sunday, right? Yes. Because pharaoh makes a Sunday law, she, she tells us about that, and also, the, the Assyrian, right, and uh, the quotes in the document, I'll give it tomorrow, in uh, 14 manuscript 91.3, talks about Nebuchadnezzar setting up the golden image, that it's the, the Sunday law, and she quotes Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 1, which is speaking about the Assyrian, right? So it's telling us that the Assyrian makes a Sunday law, right? And it was an Assyrian, this Pharaoh says in Isaiah that he was an Assyrian that oppressed him, right? 
Sister White says it's the Sunday law. And in Exodus chapter 5, verse 5, what is the issue? The Sabbath issue, right? So what we have is Pharaoh oppressing God's people, a new birth. Pharaoh oppressing God's people, a new birth, right? And this is how we came to understand that there's these two times of trouble, right? And at the end of it, there's a new birth, right? And, and we understand that it's speaking about these two Sunday laws, or one Sunday law, but in between that Sunday law, there's a little time of peace, right? Okay. We all remember how this is how we came to understand this structure as we know it, right? So, um, many more things we can go on at that. Um, I don't want to go into the reform lines because we could spend a whole week just going into them, right? But I just want to remind us why we have these two times of trouble. Now, if you just go to Romans chapter 1. In verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So, it's not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Right? So, God has an order. Right? When Christ came, was there an order? Who, who did he come to when, in his time? Yeah, he, 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 that's true, he came to the lost sheep, but he came to his church, right? He wasn't specifically there for the Gentiles, although he blessed Gentiles in that time because they came seeking for him, and he's showing this, right? The Gentiles come in this time, and they're asking, you have to bless them, right? But it's not a time for him to go to the Gentiles, because there is a time, there's a time for everything under the sun, right? Okay, so there's a time to die, there's a time to be born, right? And it's very important, those verses, because they're, they're showing us the different aspects of what's taking place in the plan of salvation, right? So, what is this time? No, in relation to Ecclesiastes, a time to be born, right? Okay, so it's marking the birth. So every time a way mark comes, what changes for us? What changes? The what, sorry? Okay, when you go through the, the line, right, there's, every time you come to a way mark, what changes? Okay, maybe my question is just too obscure, right? The okay, let go go to no first of all, before we go there, before we go there, right? Just let me finish this point or I'll lose my thought, right? So first here he says, first to the church, then to the um, to the Greek, right? And if you just turn the page to um, Chapter 2, verse 6. It says, We will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well doing seek for glory and honour and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. So the Jew and the Greek, or the Jew and the Gentile, it's the same thing, in that order, right? So, Christ is our example in all things, right? So when Christ has this new birth here, 
he represents somebody that has been made perfect in Christ, right? Was Christ perfect? Was he holy? When he at his baptism? Yes. And this is where the Lord needs to get us, right? Because first the Jew, followed by the Gentile, right? Those reform lines have many things to teach us, but it's teaching us this point that when we get to the end of our line, the end of the, the second birth, you're, you know, you're this perfect people that can now be sent to the world, right? And we will um, go through all these things as we, we go in, in the week. Okay, but coming back to that point I was making, every time you come to a line, there's a different work, right? So when you come to this way mark here, right, what's now starting for you? Say it louder. Right, it's an increase of knowledge, right? You're learning the types. This is where you begin to increase in knowledge, right? You come to this way mark, what happens? Sorry? John. So what's what's it marking? Is it the same work as here? No. Because you've progressed to the next stage, right? So John was also holy and filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So these these reform lines are laying out for us point by point, step by step, at every way mark, a different work that's going to be required of us people depending on the stage that they're at, right? Okay. Right, so, um, the Alpha and Omega, let's go down to um, these two reformers, the three decrees, right? So, Artaxerxes was the beginning of what? Beginning of the 2300 days. What was October 22nd? The end, right? So you had this beginning and, and end marking right there, okay? And the Cyrus, the Rias, and Artaxerxes are illustrated, those three decrees are illustrated three commands or three messages from Christ to build his temple, right? Because Cyrus and the Rias and Artaxerxes were rebuilding a literal temple. Right? And the first, the second, and third angel's message were rebuilding a spiritual temple. But we know on October 22nd, 1844, it wasn't complete. It's just a type, right? These four lines are types that they are to be brought together, line upon line, right? And it brings us down to our line. What, how do we begin our line and why? How do we get to this 1989 right here? Sorry? Dial 1140. Dial 1140, yes. What about it? Right, so in 1798, a part of Dial 1140 was fulfilled, right? So go to Miller's Rules. Go to rule number uh, 13. It says, to know whether we have the true historical event for the fulfillment of a prophecy, if you find that every word of the prophecy after the figures are understood is literally fulfilled, then you may know that your history is the true event. However, if one word lacks fulfillment, then you must look for another event or wait its future development, right? So Sister White says very clearly that 1798 was the time of the end, right? But did Daniel 1140 lack words of fulfillment? Yes, only half of it was fulfilled. And the other half of it was referring to a different power retaliating, right? So the part that was fulfilled was the, the king of the south coming against the king of the north, right? And that's what you see in 
1798, right? Yes. And then we wait for the future fulfillment, not based upon time, because when you come to this point, what is no longer? Time. Time, right? So when this event comes to pass, now you have, now you see the events before your eyes, right? Now come on, listen. I'm making this point because this point is such an important point, right? Because what is happening in the world at the moment? So is it like a, the war. The war. And did did we, you know, when it started, did we understand it? How, how did we begin to understand it? By going to the Bible, right? We had to go here because it says, Thy words are truth, right? You can't trust in anything else, right? You have to go here and say, Okay, maybe the Bible is marking this event, right? Because it says, To know whether you have the true historical event for the fulfillment of a prophecy, if you find that every word of the prophecy after the figures are understood. <coughs> so, what this war, what, are, what you, Ukraine and Russia, what are they? Yes, yes but according to this, this rule here, figures, figures right? They, they are types, you're right, right? So you look at the figures and say, well, what do they represent? Who, who are they? So you have to go to the Bible, right? And that's what happened, or that's what didn't happen in 1989. It was afterwards they understood it, right? But what does God want? What, what does he need at the end of the world? He needs prophets, right? What does a prophet do? He prophesies. After or before? Before, before right? Okay, go to Isaiah, um, go to Isaiah chapter 41. Verse 21. It says, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the King of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. What's he saying? Bring forth strong reasons that will show us what's going to happen. Right? Let them show the former things. So what's the strong reasons? The former things, right? What they be that we may consider them. So when somebody brings forth these former things, what are you to do? You're to consider them, study them, think about them, right? And know the latter end of them. Or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter that we may know that ye are gods. Whoa, brother and sister. So if you can tell what's going to come before it comes, what does it say you are? With a small g, right? Not God up there. But you're like God, right? How are we to be? Like God. Yeah, like, like God, right? With a big G, right? We are to be like Him. Christ with a big G, right? And but when we are like him, we will have a mind like him, right? Who is the author of all prophecy? Christ, right? So if we have the mind of Christ, we will know and understand prophecy, right? Before it comes to pass, you will be able to take God's word and say and say exactly what's gonna happen before it happens. And the whole world will know that ye are gods, right? Because can Satan do that? No, only God can do it. And the only God that can do it is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, because he demonstrates the end by the beginning, right? So Daniel 11.40, it's beginning 
was 1798 and 1989, right? So now, type, figures are understood, right? Because now you can go, take the figures, understand them, and say, and every word was fulfilled in those two events, right? So now you know you have the correct fulfillment for the prophecy, right? And it doesn't contradict because line upon line that this that it's showing the same thing, right? It's showing something that's to be brought together. So what's happening now in Ukraine is not some strange thing. Because you know when you read um, Isaiah 41, it says, go back to the former things so that you can know what's going to come, right? And I know that somebody here uh, I'm not saying they were making an argument, but they made that observation, right? But the point is, how how did they demo, how did they know that 1989 uh, was the correct fulfillment? Did they go back, or were they were they going to were they going to verses that were actually pointing to the end of the world? You know what I mean? I mean, Daniel 11.40, it was never fulfilled in the past. So they didn't go back in the past to look at the past to understand 1989. Daniel 11.40 was something that was going to happen in the future. It's pointing forward. And therefore, they had to go forward to Daniel 11.40, look at it, think, ah, that's what we should see come to pass. Now the type's fulfilled, right? Gog and Magog, is it something from the past or the future? Okay, so it's the same point, right? We just forget this. We think it's some strange thing now that we're having to go to a prophecy at the end of the world to understand something at the beginning. But this beginning must come to pass because it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 46, what? First comes the natural, followed by the spiritual, right? So there has to be a natural fulfillment first. And if it's not, if there's not been one, then we must look out for it, right? We must be looking to see, okay, where's this natural fulfillment? Right? The plagues, for instance. Are the plagues something that happens at the end of the world? Yes. Are they going to be prefigured prior to that point? Yes, because first comes the natural, followed by the spiritual, right? Okay. Everybody get that point? Yes. We really need to hone our minds into those points, right? So, um, this is what gave us 1989 and began our line, right? So, at the beginning of the line, right, 1989, who came together? Georgia State, typifying Sunday law, right? Let us down to 9-11. What's 9-11 typifying? Judgment. Follow Babylon. Right? Babylon gets punished for her iniquity, right? So, is that a parallel to Pharaoh persecuting God's people here, followed by new birth? Yes. Why is this new birth a parallel to judgment? Sorry? Muscle. Okay, so, so I'm, not, I'm not trying to. The angel, the sword that came to Moses, the circumcision. Yeah, yes, yes. I mean, all your answers are, are right, but it's, it's maybe my question is bad. The point I'm trying to make at the end there, there's two classes, right? One class gets the judgment, the other class gets the blessing, right? Blessing, curse, right? The blessings and the curses. Line, so this is what teaches us, when we study line upon line, one line emphasizes certain points, another line emphasizes other points, right? Okay, let me give you an example. Moses, when you go through Moses' line, what's the whole theme 
of this life that has a theme. The law of God, right? Because what did the Lord want to do to Moses there? Kill him, right? It was a judgment. Because what had he not done? Circumcised. So if you're not, you don't receive the new birth right there, what will you receive? The curse. The angel with the sword will come down and slay you, right? So you see, curse for one, blessing for the other, right? So the theme of Moses, right, was all about the law of God because the law said you had to circumcise your son, right? Moses was the one that wrote the books of the law, right? And the seven last, uh, the ten plagues, he typified the seven last plagues, as the word says, right? And what did the seven last plagues, uh, why did they fall on people? Because they broke God's law and didn't repent, right? The Passover, is it according to God's law? Are we to keep the Passover? How? By, by eating his flesh and drinking his blood, right? Communion. But spiritually speaking, it's through um, eating his flesh and drinking his blood, the word, right? So the point is, the, the line of Moses, the whole line of Moses is about the law of God, right? What about the line of Christ? What was the theme? Just think of Christ. How did he teach? Parables. Right? So, just go to um, Matthew 13, verse 35. Verse 34 and 35. You got there? Matthew 13, 34 and 35. It says, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. So Jesus only spoke in parables, right, purposely, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So what are the parables? Secrets. And the parables are in agreement with the I am, right? Because the I am is the Alpha and Omega. And the Alpha and Omega is the type and the anti-type. What is the parable? It's a type that points to an anti-type, right? Because when Christ is teaching parables, he's trying to take you from the natural to the spiritual, right? It's the Alpha and Omega, right? And this is what Christ was teaching you. So you have, you have the law of God, the natural to spiritual, which is the Alpha and Omega. What about, what about the three decrees? Okay, Karen got it right. It was about prayer. How do we know that? Okay, Daniel, because Daniel's here at the beginning, right? And Daniel, here, he had to fast for these three weeks and pray in order to overcome Satan, right? And even before this point, he was praying and asking the Lord to understand the prophecies, right? Who else is in that line praying? Nehemiah, and it's this, it's, the prayer is according to Leviticus 26. What about Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9? Is it according to Leviticus 26? Yes. What about Ezra's prayer? Is it Ezra in that line? Yes, it's the line of Ezra, right? The three degrees. He also prayed the same prayer as Daniel and Nehemiah, right? What about this writing, this line here? What was it all about? Millerite line. What's the, what's the Millerite line all about? 
Methodology. Sorry? Methodology. Right. Methodology. Okay. Biblical rules of interpretation. Right? William Miller's dream, he got given a key that unlocked the Bible, right? It was the rules of interpretation. One of those was the day for a year principle, right? That helped him to unlock time prophecy. Amen? So if we are if we are to bring everything together line upon line, what do we have right here? Are we to keep God's law? Are we to understand the natural to the spiritual? Yes, because we're the people at the end of the world. What's our only defense, as the White says? Prayer. Prayer. Can we understand anything without correct rules? No. Right? All those things apply to us, right? Who are bringing all those things together here to the Alpha and Omega, right? Amen? So, principles, rules, right? It's, 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 we're, are we to read the Bible or search the Bible? Search the scriptures. We're searching for these principles, for these rules. And when we see it, we mark it and keep it and remember it, right? Because it's only by these principles and rules that we will be kept from being deceived by the deceiver, right? And he's much smarter than any of us, right? And we, the only thing we need to keep us from that is prayer, right? But the book of James says, what about prayer? James chapter 1. Do not think that you can ask anything of the Lord, right? So when you pray, you can't just pray to the Lord, Lord, give me a Mercedes. Right? How are we to pray? According to his word. It says, if you ask anything according to my will, I will hear you. Right? So in order to pray according to his will, we must understand it. Otherwise, we're prayer in vain. Right? We're praying vain prayers that he won't answer because it's not according to his will. Right? So all these things we need. Right? And that's all these things we will incorporate into all the studies that we do over the next 10 days, right? We will see how they're all coming together and they apply every single thing to every one of us. Amen? Amen. Okay, so it was just a quick overview and the last thought that I want to give, right, is that Sister White already says this represents the Sunday law, right, leads down to judgment. Because fear of at the 10th plane, when he went through the Red Sea, he got smitten, right? So you have these two times of trouble, time of peace, or you have a time of trouble, time of peace, followed by a time of trouble. And it's a repeating pattern, right? So. This is, this is what we're going to build on, right? This is what God wants us to understand, line upon line. These two times of trouble. First one for the Jew, second one for the Gentile, right? But before we can come here, right? Because I want to understand, the, remember the baptism and the cross, the parallel, right? So, before we get it, let me just make this point. Christ's line, temple cleansing to temple cleansing, right? What was he doing between those points? He's cleansing the human heart, right? And at the end he says it's finished, right? So at the end, the temple was cleansed, right? And all the people that accepted it would receive the latter rain, right? So the point is that the baptism and the cross are the same point. Right, because they're both marking a birth, right? So, therefore, you have these two temple cleansings 
here, you have these two tempo cleansings here, right? Because it's the same illustration, line upon line. Okay? So the point I want to get, what must Christ have before he can go and do this? What must he have? I mean, think of Christ's line. What did he do? What, what would this rep represent in Christ's line? If this is the temple cleansing where he begins his public ministry for three years, one, two, three, what was prior to that? Those six months preparation, right? In the time of peace. So here you have baptism, right? What has to come before the baptism? John. John has to be raised up before Christ, right? And before John comes, you have to have a time at the end because in order for John, John needs an increase in knowledge, right? So this, you see that this is just this. It's the repeating. So what happens here, he raises up in people here to go to the Gentiles. He raises up a movement here to go to the church. And that's where we're at, right? He first of all has to raise up a movement and get them to this point, and then he'll send them to the church, right? He'll bring the Sunday home. Okay, God doesn't change. It's this perfect order, perfect process. And we've not even got to the point where he's raised up John yet, right? But we know that that's in the very near future, and that's what we're preparing for. And brothers and sisters, John was the greatest prophet. Christ says it, his own words, right? And it's a, it shouldn't fill our hearts with pride. It should fill our hearts with the deepest humility because that is the greatest, I mean, nobody with any pride or any evil thoughts in their heart will ever represent John, right? John was a humble person. He was a health reformer. He was a prophet, and he brought many people to a knowledge of the truth, and he was prefigured by Elijah, right? So if we want to fill Elijah's boots, right, we need to allow Christ to cleanse us of all these evils. We need to be of all our pride and everything removed from us, right? Or we will never fulfill that slot. Amen? Amen. Okay, and that's, we're going to end on that thought tonight, and... Tomorrow we will start off with Revelation 17 and then go into Matthew 24. And point by point, we will really nail these things so that we all grasp it. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's close with, um, let's have a round of prayer. And brothers and sisters, we really need to take these things to heart, right? We must pray. So please, I encourage you at night, go pray together in your little groups. Pray for one another, right? Pray, pray, and pray without ceasing. Amen? Don't let Satan come into these meetings, right? Because you can be sure that it will come, right? So, um, if I can ask for maybe five other people to pray, maybe Sister Karen, Brother Brian, Brother Richard, Brother Lawrence, and one of our young boys. What's your name? Newton. Okay, Newton, you can close for us. Okay. Okay, I will I will start then and then you go.